I want to share real quick with you guys. I had, I wanted to go to Isaiah 40 this morning, but the sermon was pretty well done. I was preaching, as for those that don't know, it's, it's our prophecy month in Isaiah. And I've been really pouring over the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. There's so many fascinating things about Isaiah, but go to Isaiah 9. I want to share two little nuggets out of Isaiah, one of which I neglected this morning, really just for the sake of time. I mean, everything that needed to be said was said in the morning sermon, but I did have this in my notes. It's, if you don't believe me, it's here at the bottom of them. It was Isaiah 40, and uh, we'll go there in just a minute. But what I want to show you is a cool, a really neat nugget, a comparison of two things. So we're going to go back and forth between Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 40. Now, I didn't touch on all the details of it this morning, but all the way through the book of Isaiah, there are 66 chapters, just as there are 66 books in the Bible. There is a pattern, and I'm a pattern nerd. I like words and numbers and things like that. Psalm 119, the longest one, has a pattern of words throughout the entire thing. It's amazing. Um, I've touched on it before. I never really preached it because it's such a long sermon. Isaiah has a very similar pattern in a different way. Uh, it's like a mini Bible, I've heard people call it, in that the book of Isaiah deals with certain topics. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. There's 27 in the New. And it's clear that when you get to, once you get to the end of 39, the Old Testament, it's like the judgment and the curses cease, and it's more about the blessing and the hope and the reward the resurrection and things to come. Uh, what I want to show you, and I'm going to show you in both real quick, and then I'll read it in context so you understand. Your, go to Isaiah 9, and if you would, get your finger also in Isaiah 40. So in Isaiah 9, if you'll look at verse number 18, look what it says. It says, For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and the thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest, and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Okay, now this is talking about the fruits of wicked people, uh, those that reject God and want to do their own way, and that's what he was. we dealt with it this morning, the sinful nation that rejected God and you know, they were doing all sorts of abominable sacrifices and abortions and strange things that were going on in that nation that he had to deal with. Now go to Isaiah 40. Uh, and we're going to come back to Isaiah 9, and I'll explain. But I want, to see, I want you to see this phrase, mount up. It says of the wicked, especially the wicked leaders, the religious leaders that were preaching lies, it says, they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. God's going to torch them. It says elsewhere he'll come with a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning and God will pour out his wrath on those wicked leaders in Isaiah 40 go to the very last verse verse number 31 and it says but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint now, here's the difference, and I'll show you the context because I do believe it's important. The wicked leaders of this world, the people that reject Jesus, the people that hate God, they will be, as if you were, set on fire, and they will mount up as burning smoke. But those that wait upon the Lord, that's to trust in the Lord, depending upon the Lord. As a five-star waiter in a restaurant, how can I serve you, Lord? What can I do for you, right? A servant of the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, this is a reference to the resurrection. Because what he then begins to describe is supernatural. This is where some people think that once you're resurrected or you go to heaven, you'll have wings. Because look at the description. It says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I want you to understand this, that in the resurrection, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to pour out his wrath on the earth of fire and judgment. And those that wait upon the Lord, they will be resurrected. Now, it's in man's nature, I believe, to have a desire to fly, isn't it? If you've ever flown before, you're like, this is awesome. I want to do it again. He's like, no way, man. <laughs> Leave me on the ground, right? <laughs> To a certain extent, I'm not ready to go without the parachute or whatever, right? But uh, think about just 
all the development and the technology, we all want to, you know, it's like we, we try to imitate and we study the birds and the wings and everything, the aerodynamics, we want to fly. And I think one day we might, but really it's not necessarily that we'll have wings like a bird. It's that we're going to be supernatural in the resurrection as the Lord Jesus Christ, who was now, if you will, beyond this three-dimensional body, overcoming the fourth dimension of time, resurrected into, I don't know, the fifth dimension, tenth dimension, it's beyond me, that's all theory, but... Jesus could walk through walls. He ascended up into heaven, and he said he's going to come back in like manner as we saw him go. And so now, there's two ways that you're going to mount up in the end. One is to mount up as smoke from the burning fuel of fire, from the destruction and the wrath of the Lord. And the second is, in victory, overcoming this flesh, you'll mount up as, a wing, as, a, as an eagle, like wings of eagles, as if you could fly. You can run all day long and not be weary. You can walk and you will not faint. Now go back to Isaiah 9 and let's just look at the context. I told you this morning, and I didn't get a chance to look at all of it, that you know we looked at the man and the message of Isaiah, and that all throughout the chapter, it's, he says there's a judgment coming, but then there's some hope, right? And he's talking about the wrath of God will be poured out, but there is a resurrection. Uh, there's the man and the message. Then there's a ton of prophecy that was messianic that Christ would come. There's a good amount, a substantial amount of prophecy about the resurrection, the, the, our body coming back from the grave. And then there's an enormous amount of prophecy about the millennium. So we'll talk briefly about the messianic and the millennium. Uh, you're back in Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse number 6. Well, hey, let's look at five while we're there. Uh, for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise. These are those that uh, he judges. And garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. But here's the good news, verse 6. Look at this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Look, we're called to be peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed be the peacemakers. This is the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's eternal God. And He loves us. He's talking about giving us victory in a form of government that will never exist on earth without Jesus. Look at the next verse. Of the increase of His government and peace... There shall be no end. And I just have to pause for a second, because as you look at verse 6, it says, I want to I take a step back and deal with the government thing. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. This is a prophecy through the Spirit of God, through the mouth of Isaiah. And this would be his second son. It was a prophecy of him having a son. Uh, but he, what, what he says here, And the government shall be upon his shoulders. There's the application of when Jesus Christ came because Isaiah's son was not God. And when the government on his shoulders, now it sounds like, yeah, he's got it under control. But that's not what it's saying. If I asked you to come up here and let me give a demonstration of what it looks like with me on your shoulders, I would be in control of you. I would be oppressing you and hurting you, right? Isn't that the face of fascism? A government boot on your face, right? And isn't that what happened to Jesus when he came? in the form of a servant, in the form of a man. He served. He laid his life down. It was taken from him. He said, no, you're not taking it. I'm giving it up, and I will take it again. I will resurrect. Why? Because he is the Prince of Peace. He is God Almighty. The government was oppressing Jesus when he first came, and yet when he comes back, oh, he's going to set up a new form of government that no other world order or government will be able to resist or reject. And that's what he's talking about in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace... There shall be no end. That's global peace. It will come one day, but not until the Lord returns. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Oh, he is zealous in a righteous thing. We have something to look forward to. Uh, for the sake of time, let's jump ahead. Um, Let's right, see, so go to verse 13. Verse number 13, it says, For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. 
the ancient and the honorable, he is the head. They're saying the leaders of old, the old men that were supposed to be the old wise elders in the gate, they said they've got a problem. He says uh, that he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people, look at this, cause them to err. Why are there so many people that are really confused about God, salvation, the Bible, hey, religion in general? I'll tell you, it's because of the leaders. Who are the leaders of this generation? It's the last person you see on your phone. You know, with the advent of the technology of videos and phone and influencers on social media, they are becoming the teachers that are teaching lies. Oh, you can't trust the Bible. That was written by some man. No, there are some supernatural things about this that are phenomenally impossible for a man to have put together. There are many patterns throughout the Bible. And it's the prophet that teacheth lies that God will especially judge. He says, they cause them, look at verse 16, the leaders of this people cause them to err. They that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. Boy, folly, foolishness, silliness. Isn't our world just full of people talking about the most just pointless things? Po absolutely meaningless. And they talk about it. For all this anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He says, for all these things, God is going to judge this city. He's going to keep judging. He kept his hand out. He's going to destroy it all. This is what would happen in Jerusalem. It has been accomplished. And I think there's an end times application here. Verse 18. For wickedness burneth as the fire. It shall devour the briars and the thorns. Now, in the New Testament, we see that as a reference of the works. And that would be the works of the foolish. Those that are unsaved, their very works, they're going to burn. They have an eternal hellfire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That quote in Mark chapter 9, that also comes out of Isaiah. There are more quotes in the New Testament from Isaiah than any other book. He says, For wickedness burneth as the fire, it shall devour the briars and the thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. And there it is. And they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. Now go back to chapter 40 with me. Go back to Isaiah 40. They shall mount up like smoke. I'll tell you one thing. I, I don't want to uh, go down in, in flames. You know what I mean? And I know people joke about things like, if I'm going to go out, I tell you, I want to go out in a flash, bang, boom, and I'm out of here and done. I don't want to lay in a bed and suffer. And I could see why some people may say that. Over, I mean, really, dying a violent death is not a pleasant thing. But this is talking about an eternal judgment eternal hellfire where the worm dieth not hey how about revelation 14 10 where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night we see in luke chapter 16 the sermon from hell where the man that was alive the rich man when he got down there in hell and he says i'm tormented in this flame please send somebody to my house and tell my five brothers not to come here he says hey though one rose from the dead Hey, they have Moses and the prophets. Hey, they have the word of God. Why don't they listen to that? But many will not, and they will end up mounting up as smoke. Chapter 40, look at verse 1. He says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. If you ever sit down and read all of Isaiah, it only takes about four hours. This is the turning point in the story. Comfort. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God said, I judged and I judged double. Why? Because they knew they had the law. They were the people of God and they rejected God and his law. Verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. If you know, that is prophecy of John the Baptist, what he preached, that is literally what he preached when Jesus Christ came. He said, prepare your hearts for God. Here he comes. And when he gets here, you better be right with him. You better search after him. There's one mightier than me that's coming. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was preparing men's hearts for the point of reconciliation. Malachi 4 deals with that, that he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children 
to the fathers. It was a, a, a message of restoration, not just from man to God, but families to one another. He says in verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now this is not the messianic portion of the prophecy. This is the millennial portion of the prophecy. If you understand an end times timeline, you have a span of seven years that begins with the Antichrist ruling. In the middle of the seven years, the Lord returns after much persecution and tribulation and the mark of the beast and the abomination of desolation. And at that midpoint, with the Antichrist, Jesus comes. There's a resurrection of those that are alive. And then God begins to pour out his wrath on the earth for the next three and a half years. At the end of that three and a half years, he comes back and he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is Zechariah 14. All the things that play out in that, when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, it talks about like every wall is going to fall over from every building. Every mountain will be brought low. Every valley will be brought up. He's literally going to cause an earthquake of such a great shaking. It says elsewhere in Isaiah that it's like the world is turned upside down. Everything changes. The, the entire topography is completely changed, and it's reset. When you parallel that to Ezekiel, you see in Ezekiel 47, it talks about the river of life, the tree of life. Uh, uh, Revelation deals with it a little bit as well that, that, that he will send forth the river of life healing the earth and just as the garden of Eden was originally that's what the millennial reign of Christ will be like we will not die quickly and there will be no violence and the lion will de deal with the lamb they will lay one another at peace and the wolf and the child it will play with a, a snake and not get bitten and what fascinating concepts that there really will be peace because God is in charge and his government will increase and we will be part of that it tells us that we will rule and reign with Christ 1,000 years it tells us that in three different places and now that's a fascinating concept during that millennial reign of Christ the whole earth is going to change and it will not be like it was before so well, how will we survive without buildings? Well, I think people will begin to rebuild, but things will be destroyed. It will, that's the, the great reset that I look forward to, is when he sort of clears the canvas and gives us a reset. And those that have already either been resurrected at his coming or that died and are resurrected, we will rule and reign with him over the earth. We will be part of his government. And those that survive through that time of trial and wrath, they will begin to reproduce and multiply. And according to the numbers, I believe there will be such a multitude bigger than has ever existed on the earth. So it won't take long and people will reproduce to great numbers. Uh, and so God will save the flesh in that sense. Look what he says in verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. We will see God face to face. We will see him in existence. As he says in verse 7, the grass withereth. Actually, I skipped verse 6. He says, the voice, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. What's he saying? Your body is like dirt. It's going to burn up just like grass does. It doesn't take long for grass to disappear. It comes up, it gets mowed down, it gets burned, cast in the oven. He says, your body's much like that, and so is all of your works. He says in verse 7, the grass withereth. The flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want you to understand this. Your life is short. Your existence on earth is very limited and temporary. It doesn't take long. I mean, you know, <laughs> Brother Chad, you, you remember back in high school, don't you? And you're so far from that, I mean, you'll be in a wheelchair next year. All right, I'm just kidding. He needs a walker real soon. We're about the same age. so. Uh, but it doesn't take long. And you're like, man, how, things are moving really fast. I mean, oh, Brother Julian, you were just saying the other day, like, I mean, I didn't know I was going to be a dad this quick. I mean, I thought I had a few years ahead of me, right? So many times we just get uh, uh, going along with life, and then we look up, and it's like a year has passed. A decade has passed. Time moves really fast. And you have to realize your span of life on this earth is literally, it's a drop in the bucket. That's a Bible term. It's like one drop of water 
in a bucket of eternity. Eternity lasts forever. Our time here is short, and we need to make it count. God's word, he says, look in verse 8, the word of our God shall stand forever. What he says, he will do. When God makes a promise, he will keep it. Verse 9, O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up the voice with the stranger. Lift it up. Be not afraid. And that's what I say to you. Lift up your voice. Don't be afraid. Tell people about God. Look what he says. And say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. There's the command. Lift up your voice. Don't be afraid. Open your mouth. Tell people about God. Verse 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. That's representing the Lord in the sense he sits at the right hand, or salvation by the right hand. It uses that phrase elsewhere. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Now think about this. When Jesus comes back, and you're resurrected in the twinkling of an eye, you're changed, you get a new body, he says his reward is with him. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, there are things that while you do it here, you will be rewarded in eternity. That's not just in heaven, that's also on the new earth, that's also during the millennium. His reward is with him, he'll reward you for your works, but then he gets busy and his work is before him. Now he's going to change the earth. And we have a part to play in that. He says in verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Verse 11 proves that through the three and a half years of the devil's wrath, the tribulation of the saints, and through the three and a half years of of the, tri of the wrath of God, people will actually live through that time that never take the mark of the beast, never get resurrected. Human beings will continue to survive even to the uttermost, uh, uh, just total devastation. They'll still survive. And here, those that are with young, because isn't that kind of the fear? You read Matthew 24, and it's like, uh, you know, or Luke, uh, what is it, 21, where it's talking about those that are with child. Woe unto those, the child is the suck in those days. You're like, oh man, I should have, oh, I'm worried about my kids. Aren't you guys, I mean, that's a natural instinct, and we should embrace that natural instinct. I'm concerned for the future of my children, and oh, don't you know the economy is going to break down next year? Oh no, how am I going to feed my kids? You know what? I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to do what He says, and He's going to take care of me. And He's saying this here through all of those trials. Women bearing children will come through. And he says, look what he says, how he handles them. At the end of verse 11, and shall gently lead those that are with young. God's compassion is on those that can't help themselves that trust in him. Verse 12, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He's showing us, he's demonstrating how small we are. If God could measure all of the water of the earth just in the hollow of his hand who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven in the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. If you would just jump ahead to verse 28, and we'll finish with these last two verses, three verses, okay? Verse 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He's saying, don't you know? God knows everything. He lasts forever. He knows what you're thinking. He created your mind. Things are not random. We have to answer to our creator. And he says, you can't search his understanding. You can't even fathom what he knows. Look at verse 29. He, look, look what he does. Giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. I want you to see the characteristics of a loving God. When we're at our worst and we need help more than anything, he's right there to help us. He'll give us the strength in time of need. When you think you're wore out, you're too tired, you're too sleepy, I'm too broke, I'm too, I can't do it anymore. God, I can't do it anymore. He says, finally, you ask of me. He wants to help. He wants to prove himself through these miracle opportunities. Look at verse 30. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, 
and the young men shall utterly fall. What was it, Thursday night? There was two youths out here running up and down the street, racing each other, and one of them fell, didn't they? Didn't somebody fall out there, Brother Luke? You guys were out there racing, trying to foot race each other and run around the parking lot, you know, two teenage boys. I can like, never mind, I'll leave it alone. I won't pick on you. Right, but what are they doing? I mean, they're out there running. What? <laughs> Sound like they had asthma or something, right? Hey, even they're going to wear out. God's not going to wear out. When you wear out, God wants to give you the strength and the energy. And then here's, here's the crescendo of this. Look at the message here in verse 31. But they, that's us, that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. We need to learn to wait upon the Lord a little more, don't we? We need to learn to rely upon the Lord's strength a little bit more. One day we will mount up with wings as eagles. We'll be able to run and not be weary. We'll be able to walk and not faint. We'll be resurrected with a new body as a new being, with a new purpose. God has a plan for us in the future. And it starts now. We must have faith in Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for the awesome things You've shown me out of the book of Isaiah recently. And I pray that some of this would be a blessing to somebody. Lord, we love You so much. I thank You for the great day we've had here at church. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to worship You now from a whole heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.